Welcome to Know Alive Alaska. My name is Lisa Hiruki Raring, and I'm going to be moderating today's webinar. This series is a collaborative effort by NOAA Fisheries Alaska Fisheries Science Center, where I work, NOAA's Alaska Regional Collaboration Network, and NOAA's National Weather Service. This webinar series is designed to help you get to know NOAA and its work in Alaska and how we connect and work with your communities. NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, studies the ocean and the atmosphere and where the two meet, from weather to ocean to the animals that live around us. All of our speakers work for some part of NOAA or work in partnership with NOAA. We hope this gives you a sneak peek at different career paths you might be interested in. Today, we're introducing you to Alex Perry, Wynn Carney, and Amy Anderson, who work for NOAA Fisheries Office of Law Enforcement. Alex and Wynn are in Anchorage, Alaska, and Amy is in Petersburg, Alaska. While we'll be talking about NOAA's role in research and stewardship, we want to recognize that we're all coming to you from the traditional lands of Native communities who have substantial Indigenous knowledge and much to share with us. In Alaska, the NOAA Fisheries Office of Law Enforcement's work is conducted all over the state, which include the traditional homelands and waters of the Inupiat, Yupiat, Siberian Yupiat, Athabascan, Unanga, Alutik, Sugpiak, Iyak, Pinkit, Haida, and Simshin. We are honored to acknowledge that Anchorage, Alaska, where Alex and Wynn are presenting from, is the ancestral land of the Denina people who have stewarded this area for thousands of years. We're also honored to acknowledge that Petersburg, Alaska, where Amy is presenting from, is the land of the Pinkit people. We'd also like to acknowledge that we're hosting this webinar from the traditional lands of the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish people past and present. We would also like to thank Crystal and Becky, our American Sign Language translators today. A few guidelines before I hand you over to our speakers. You're all muted because we have a lot of people on the line and we want to make sure everyone can hear our speakers. However, there's a box where you can write questions and we encourage you to ask them as we go. My colleague Chris Beyer and I will be keeping track of questions for Alex, Wynn and Amy behind the scenes. They'll stop every now and again and answer a few questions. We may not get to all of our questions, but we'll try to answer as many as we can. All right, I'll hand it over to our speakers to introduce themselves. Hi everyone, sound check, Lisa? Sounds good. Great. <clears throat> Welcome everyone, thank you for joining us. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to talk to you briefly about what NOAA's Office of Law Enforcement does here in Alaska. So, uh, just a reminder, Lisa already mentioned this, but uh, NOAA stands for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Uh, Office of Law Enforcement is also a bit of a mouthful, so we will refer to ourselves as OLE from here on. So, I'll start by doing a brief introduction. Uh, we'll start by introducing Wynn, who is our assistant special agent in charge. Uh, and here is a picture of Wynn that he can tell you about. Welcome, Wynn. <clears throat> How's it going? And yes, that's a picture of me in my younger years. Um, I'm a little bit older now. Um, but, you know, I got started in uh, Office of Law Enforcement. Um, I'm from Georgia, from coastal Georgia. And I got into fishing at a young age. And as I went along and got older, I went from fishing in streams, ponds, and creeks, and got into fishing in salt water, and eventually into the ocean, as you can see here. I loved it so much, I got into, uh, I wanted to protect our natural resources <clears throat> and conserve them, so, or be a part of that. So I got into uh, the Georgia Department of Natural Resources. And after I was in the Georgia Department of Natural Resources as a state game warden, I finally got into the federal system and I started working with the Office of uh, Law Enforcement for, uh, for NOAA. And uh, here I am today. So, um, you know, it started small with fishing in ponds and creeks. And now I'm in Anchorage um, enforcing fishery regulations in Alaska. And thanks for being here. Awesome. Thank you, Wynn. Uh, next, we will introduce our enforcement officer in Petersburg, Alaska, Amy Anderson. Amy, can you please tell us about yourself and how you decided to get into Office of Law Enforcement and join our team with NOAA? Uh, yeah. Hi, I'm Amy Anderson. I currently live in Petersburg, Alaska, which is a beautiful small town in southeast Alaska. Um, I did not know about NOAA growing up or National Marine Fisheries Service or law enforcement. I 
when I graduated high school, I joined um, the Air Force. And then I, after I spent some years there, I joined the Coast Guard and I kind of got into the role of protecting marine resources with them. And then when I got out of the Coast Guard, I found that I saw, heard about this job. Actually, when I was in the Coast Guard, I had interacted with a special agent because on a boat I had boarded, we found some shark fins. And so I got to turn those over to a NOAA special agent. And that's when I discovered that they had this job out there. So um, I applied to, I thought it was so great to be able to live in a small community in beautiful Alaska and protect those resources that I enjoy participating in and being a part of. And this photo is me doing subsistence um, sockeye dip netting on one of our sister islands up, up here. So it's pretty fun to be able to enjoy the resource and help protect it. And I really love being able to travel to lots of far little regions of Alaska and see what this beautiful state has to offer. Very cool. Well, thank you, Amy, for joining and, and helping out with the presentation. Uh, the last picture you can see, it, the shortest guy over on the right side, that's me as a kid, uh, Alex Perry. So <clears throat> I grew up in a landlocked state in Colorado. Uh, I was lucky enough to grow up rafting and fishing and hunting. Uh, so I developed a love for, for all things biology. Uh, so I took a slightly different path to, to join Office of Law Enforcement. Uh, I went to college uh, and got a degree in biology in Colorado, and then I came to Alaska <clears throat> to begin working as, as a marine fisheries observer, which is a marine biologist. Uh, and I began working uh, in Alaska in 2002 uh, I've been working with fisheries for about 20 years, and I decided that I could uh, use my skills to join the mission of NOAA's Office of Law Enforcement to help protect our, na our national resources. Uh, so, um, I'm excited to be part of the team. So, we're going to start off by asking you guys for some input. Uh, we're going to do a poll and ask you guys some questions. Uh, as Lisa mentioned, uh, please type your answers into the chat box. Uh, so we're going to start out with the first question. Who here likes to catch fish? And what is your favorite fish to catch? All right. So <laughs> Hannah is saying that she does not like to fish, but I'm sure we have some other folks on the line who like to catch fish. I know that for myself, I like to go salmon fishing. Um, and actually, we were out on the Puget Sound fishing just this weekend, and I caught a rockfish, which I let go. So let's see. Um, Texas says that Texas from Colorado says that he likes to catch fish. Jim says that he likes to catch salmon. A couple people say that they don't like to fish. Whitney said that she likes to um, catch cod. Um, Anna Maria says we don't really catch fish. Um, they're in Hungary, so they're in a different environment than us. Um, but several people are saying salmon, salmon, silver salmon. Um, Jody is saying salmon as well. Alicia is saying, yes, but it's really hard and I like to catch rainbow trout. Um, Eve says that Jasper wants to catch, to learn to catch fish. And um, Azul says, I catch fish for others because I'm allergic to it myself. And Theodore says that he likes to catch fish, but he just hasn't, he, yet, he hasn't done it yet, but he wants to catch salmon. And um, Mr. Jordan is saying eight out of 10 in his classroom. And um, I believe his classroom is in Colorado, um, where you're from, Alex. So yep. um, a lot of people like to fish there. Um, Amy is saying that half of her students, rainbow trout, brown, northern, um, are so that's a variety of fish there. So we've got a lot of, oh, and Jim is actually 10 years, oh, Jim is actually Mia, 10 years old. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, so we've got a lot of variety in the types of fish that people like to catch. Excellent. Uh, I, I too agree with those who are saying salmon. Salmon is uh, really exciting and fun to catch. Uh, I also like to catch and eat halibut. And, uh, that will bring me 
my next question. Uh, so who likes to eat the fish and the meat that you harvest or your family harvest? So a lot of people fish for recreation where they like to catch and release fish, but a lot of people like to eat the fish that they catch. And so um, if you like to, to eat the fish that, that you like to fish to go to, to um, eat it, uh, Mr. Jordan was saying from his class, Rosalie was saying rainbow trout. Um, Theodore says that he eats fish from the store. Um, and uh, let's see, Miss Amy Campbell students say that most of her students eat the fish that they catch. So um, there's a lot of people who, when they go fishing, they like to eat their catch. And that's, that's pretty, a pretty important part of the, the um, activity. Um, and Mrs. Thompson is saying 10 out of 14 of her students like to eat their family's catch as well. Perfect, very cool. So uh, you can see this is a, over on the right side of the screen. Uh, this is a smoker uh, and that is filled up with sockeye salmon that I was able to catch recreationally. And that's one of my favorite for smoked fish to eat. Uh, so here in Alaska, we eat a lot of salmon and we eat a lot of wild game as well. Uh, so Office of Law Enforcement, OLE's job is to help manage our national resources sustainably. And that's going to bring me to my next question for you guys in the audience. And that is uh, a two-part question. So first, what does sustainable mean to you? Uh, and second, why do you think it's important to have sustainable fish and mammal population? Okay, so Theodore is, is saying that sustainable is to keep fish living. Um, and I'm seeing a couple other folks saying that sustainable means that you um, only catch as much as you can use. Um, Hannah is saying sustainable means sturdy, sturdy, fish. Um, Mabel and Ruby says, say that it means it lasts and keep thri keeps thriving by itself. Um, Anna Maria and her family are saying eat and shop sustainably, meaning that don't eat more than, no, don't take more than you can eat. Um, Jasper says that it means keeping the environment in balance. That's a good answer. And um, Michelle is saying that it's important to have sustainable fish and marine mammal popula marine populations so that they will last, so that they'll continue growing. Um, Jacob Bryan was saying that it helps keep all the animals going, so the populations keep, keep growing. Um, and then Amy's class is saying sustainable means to control and keep things balanced, use what you have and not in excess. And then Theodore is also saying also to keep the environment in balance. And um, and Anna Maria's family is saying for a colorful wildlife. So to have a lot of diversity in your wildlife, I guess. So these are a lot of good, good answers to your question. So what's, what's your perspective on that, Alex? Yeah, those, those <clears throat> answers are fantastic. You guys are really sharp. Uh, maybe you should be teaching this class. So uh, <laughs> the Office of Law Enforcement, uh, when we think about sustainable uh, and we think about sustainable populations, uh, it means being able to harvest those populations. And, and a number of you in the audience mentioned that. Uh, to harvest a population of fish or marine mammals or other kinds of mammal uh, at a rate that does not exceed its ability to reproduce and maintain itself for the future. Uh, so ultimately it's all about you and future generations. So the fishermen of today could fish with an eye towards allowing you guys to continue the practice of fishing. Uh, and then the, the populations can ma maintain health uh, and maintain that sustainability that we're talking about. So that then your kids can continue to catch fish and enjoy those resources and enjoy harvesting those resources. Uh, so I mentioned briefly there that uh, <clears throat> it's not just fish. So at NOAA's Office of Law Enforcement, um, and particularly in Alaska, uh, we also deal with marine mammal harvesting. Uh, so in Alaska, 
our native populations for thousands of years have traditionally uh, harvested subsistence marine mammals. So they've harvested seals, um, sea lions, various other types of mammals, whales as well. Uh, so we work with them in order to ensure that that can be done in a sustainable way as well uh, and protect, protect their traditions and protect uh, that subsistence harvesting. So uh, this next slide, I'm going to turn it over to Amy. Hello. So I'm going to be showing you a PowerPoint presentation. Typically, when I teach a group of students this, I it's a hands-on presentation that I would bring you out in the parking lot and you guys would see an ocean and you guys would be the fishermen and you guys would learn how to manage that resource yourself. Sadly, we can't do that today. We're doing it online and I can't give you candy for when you bring the fish back to me. So I apologize for that. But what I'm going to be showing you is if typically you guys would each be acting as a fisherman with a boat and you would have a certain number of fish that you could go out and collect. And when it, this is to show why rules are important or why we even have these rules in the, in the first place. Um, if I just let everyone in your class go out and everyone could catch as much fish as they wanted, we quickly find that, you know, after five minutes, all of the fish in our pretend ocean is gone. So this presentation will show, you know, why we have rules and how those rules kind of um, come into effect. So they're going to turn on this presentation for us. Just a second. Okay. And just as I'm loading this up, I wanted to let you know that um, Mabel and Ruby said that they really like your um, uniform. So I'm about to start the presentation. So here is a brief rundown on why we manage fisheries. Here we have an image of the Gulf of Alaska, which is a large body of water. And as you can see, we have several species that live in the Gulf of Alaska. There are several communities in Alaska that wants to eat these fish, catch them and sell them so other people can eat them. And we need to find a strategy to manage this. So as you can see, we have different boats that can participate. Some boats are, are big and can catch lots of fish in one fishing trip. Some boats are just being used by a family or a subsistence fisherman who maybe can only catch a couple fish at a time. And so we have all different players and some might only want one species of fish or a gear type can only catch one kinds of fish, such as you're not gonna catch a crab really with a hook and line like you would a salmon. So, but if, if there was no management, these fishermen can go out and catch all of the fish and they could all be happy. You know, they might not be as happy when they notice that, oh, I only caught my two halibut, but this guy caught, you know, five halibut in this fishing trip. You know, how do we do this fair? You know, so one of the issues that would happen if there was no management is that you can see there might not be any fish left in the middle. You know, we, we don't want to overfish the fish. And also we don't want one group to benefit just because maybe they can have bigger boats and then the people who live in small communities don't get any fish left over. So as you can see in this map behind these fishermen, there's lots of different areas that have been determined. And this was determined by councils that were set up. And the councils are made up of lots of different stakeholders. And the stakeholder is someone who has some sort of stake in what's going on. So these could be fisheries, these fishermen, they could be you know, industry, the processors that process them, they could be the communities where these fish are caught. And they say, let's all come together and talk about it and discover a good process for knowing how many fish are out in the water, how many fish we should catch and where and when. We might have different fishery seasons and all of this. So these things change all the time because, you know, things can change. Maybe in one year, we know that not many fish will be returning. But with this management that the council set up, it lets us have fish that can be caught so everyone can benefit, everyone can get fish that they need, and that there's also more fish left out there so in the future we can go back out next year and catch fish. So our management is trying to do it in a sustainable way using science that benefits all the stakeholders out there.
So that well, was my presentation. And I want to see if any of you guys have any questions about it. I know it's very short and it doesn't cover the whole process, but I just wanted to give an overview to you guys. So Hunter was wondering whether the the um, activity that you went just went through is also called the tragedy of the commons. Um, that is similar to it. Um, I would say that this is based of it. Of you know, if if everyone tries to get what they want, then yet there might not be any left, and that's why regulations and rules have been put in place. This is more just based towards the fisheries and overview of why we have the regional councils that determine the rules for their area. And um, I think there was the, a question about how many fisheries are there that you monitor? It looked like it looked like there were a lot of different kinds of fish there. And if you don't know the total number, it's okay. It's just, it's some. is it something that the kids could look up or do you have an approximate number? I, I was thinking about this before the presentation and you know, I could say, maybe we have five in Alaska, but really, you know, you could have just thinking of halibut, because I, I help regulate halibut, but we have commercial halibut, I have sport halibut to regulate, I have subsistence halibut to regulate, you know, I might, or, and it could be, you know, Pacific cod, Pacific cod who are caught on inside state waters or a joint with the federal or they could just be straight federal waters. They could be Pacific cod cotton pot gear or Pacific cod cotton trawl gear. It's lots of different fisheries, but each of those different players have their own separate rules. So a lot of times, and it might be, oh, you're a 60 foot vessel, you're in this category, and you're a 60 foot vessel, you're or a 50 foot vessel, you're in this category. So you know, it's really hard to put a number on it because every single fisherman and fisher fishing boat out there is a little different. That's really interesting. I never thought about, we were just learning about different kinds of fishing gear a couple of webinars ago um, when we were talking about minimizing bycatch and how, how the industry works with scientists to make sure that they're not catching the fish that they don't want to catch. And so it's interesting that, you know, in as far as law enforcement goes, you're looking at different regulations for different types of boats and different types of gear that they're using. Um, we did have a question from, um, Adrian, who wanted to know what would happen to that area if all the fish were taken out or fished out? I think it would be really hard for, you know, the Gulf of Alaska necessarily to have all of its fish fished, um, overfished, because it is a very big area. But there are parts of the U.S. and other parts of the world where, you know, they've depleted their resources in that area. And then now the fishermen have to go farther out into international waters or maybe into another country's waters to look for that fish. And sometimes fish, you know, if the water gets turned too warm or it's no longer a good environment for the fish to grow, sometimes the fish just don't come back on their own. So we want to ensure that we can do whatever we can to keep the fish around so I can continue to eat them and the fishermen can catch them and sell them and we can all enjoy them. Great. Um, and then uh, Mrs. Thompson's class wanted to know what the difference is between NOAA and the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. Well, NOAA, National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, is a federal organization. And as you can see on this map, I am, we go out all the way to 200 nautical miles offshore. So the Department of Fish and Game for Alaska is a state organization, and their reach only goes three nautical miles off the land of Alaska because that's state waters. Right. So it's it's a different different waters that they're looking at and I'm, I'm sure that you probably also work in partnership with um, the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. Oh, we do we love our state partners we work with them a lot. Great well we have a, another of several other questions but I noticed that we're um, where we have a lot of other stuff to cover. So maybe I'll hold on to that and we can go on to the next section. Excellent. Well, thank you, Amy, very much for that. Um, so <clears throat> OLE is very interested in issues that are affecting the collection of data used to make management decisions. And Amy just explained to you uh, part of the management side of things, why we manage fish why we manage fisheries, and why we manage populations. So uh, for this next part, uh, we'll have 
Lisa Rule a short video. All right, so I'm going to queue up the video here and we'll learn a little bit about monitoring. Very high priority for us is to deal with any cases that deal with skewing of the sustainable fisheries data, the reporting that goes to the agency so they can make management decisions about when fisheries are opened or closed, bycatch rates, those sorts of things. Those are critical to the success of the fisheries and therefore are very important to us. And our highest priority is cases that really influence management decisions. Cut that and lay it right in there. This data is collected in a variety of ways. The most traditional method is from dockside interactions with commercial and recreational fishermen. Enforcement officers check permits and logbooks, and the setup of fishing gear to prevent bycatch. Basically, they make sure everything in the trip reports matches up with what's received by the processing plants. Monitoring and inspection also extend into the recreational sector. The goal is to maintain a sustainable resource and create a level playing field for all fishermen. So your limit would have been 10? It was. So you guys uh, are good to go. Back to you. Excellent. Thank you. So that gave you, uh, and Amy's presentation, give you a brief concept of what it is to, to manage the resources. Uh, and when we're talking about resource management, and particularly uh, sustainable resource management, we like to conceptualize this as a, a three-legged stool, which you can see on your screen. Uh, so there are three legs to the stool. Uh, we have one that is science. We have one that is management, and we have one that is enforcement. So NOAA provides all three of those different levels of, of uh, resource, sustainable resource management. So on the science side, uh, marine biologists like I used to do, uh, go out into the ocean and take data, collect data on the health of the populations. So how healthy are the populations currently? Uh, and they use that data to inform the management leg. So uh, you can determine how healthy a particular population is, and the management can use those data in order to set quotas. Uh, now, a quota is the amount of a particular population of fish or mammal that can be harvested, and usually that's within a certain year. Uh, so each year, the science changes a little bit because the populations change from year to year, uh, and then the quotas may change from year to year uh, set by management. Management is also responsible for defining our regulations putting in place laws that the fishermen and the resource users and harvesters have to follow. And the last leg of, of the stool, enforcement, uh, is we use those laws that are set by the management uh, to ensure, and Amy mentioned this earlier, to ensure that everybody is able to continue to harvest in a way that is equitable or fair to everybody. Uh, so, uh, let's see, we have another video here, uh, and that is going to tell you a little bit more. All right, so here we go with our second video here, or our third video, I guess it is. There's three pieces to the fisheries management. The first is science requires science to be able to determine what your needs are. The second part of it is the management, and then the third part of it is enforcement. You need each one of those pieces to be able to make that three-legged stool stand. NOAA's Office of Law Enforcement is integral to the success of NOAA's mission of protecting and conserving marine resources and their habitats. Hi, I'm Officer Carrick, National Marine Fisheries. I'm here to do a vessel inspection on uh, all your fisheries logbooks and permits. Uh, do you have those available? Thank you. NOAA's agents and officers are responsible for enforcing more than 35 federal statutes, over more than 3 million square miles of open ocean, and 85,000 miles of U.S. coastline. 
including the country's 13 national marine sanctuaries, its marine national monuments, and the enforcement of international treaties. We're getting a lot of support for what, what our mission is. Where we're headed, what we're trying to do, what we're targeting, is right in line with what the industry is interested in doing, and also the recreational fishermen as well. All right, Alex, it's back to you now. Great, thank you for showing that, Lisa. So I'm gonna ask the audience here, uh, what do you guys think happens if you remove one of those legs of the stool? If you take science away, if you take management away, or if you take enforcement away? So what do you think happens to that stool? So Theodore is very quick to say everything collapses. And so Anna Maria's family is saying it chaos. Alicia is saying it falls down. Cam says the system fails. So yeah, I think most people are saying that things don't work if one of those those legs breaks. You guys nailed it. Perfect. Good answers. Again, I think you should be teaching this instead of us. Uh, so you are very correct. Uh, if you take away one leg of the stool, let's say you take away the enforcement, uh, the harvesters then don't necessarily have to follow the rules. Um, there's, there's no incentive for them to follow the laws and the rules and the quotas that management and data have, uh, and science have set. Uh, so they may overfish. And when overfishing occurs, um, and, and Amy talked about this as well, what you see is the resources crash uh, and your, your resource management fails because it is no longer the magic word sustainable. So at this point, uh, we're going to take a break and let you guys ask us any questions that you have so far uh, that you haven't had a chance to get answered yet. Uh, so if the so, other presenters can come on screen, uh, we would love to field all of your questions. All right. Well, we had a couple of questions that were were. Um that were collected up from the previous session. And so uh, Mabel and Ruby were wondering, do people try to break the law a lot? Do you catch people who are trying to, to you know, get around the rules? I would say that 99% of the people I come in contact with are following the rules. Um, and usually they're happy to see us out there too, because, you know, they've been following the rules. They're happy to know that, you know, there's a reason they've been following it, that, you know, we're gonna come out and check, but very rarely do I actually find people who are trying to break the rules. Right, that's good to know. Theodore was wondering, Amy, what happens in a regular day for you? But, um, so some days we go out, we have a 37 foot patrol boat here in Petersburg. Some days we will go out and we'll check boats on the water or we might patrol, we have a glacier near us. We might um, go over there, do a marine mammal patrol and make sure nobody is harassing the harbor seals that like to get on the ice there. We might watch the whale watchers, or if I'm on land, I might board the boats as they're offloading their catch and double check that they fished in the right area and they were allowed to be fishing for that species. So it, it can be different every day today. And I travel a lot all over Alaska. They'll send me out to Dutch Harbor. I've been to Kodiak. I think there's a class there that's watching. I've been out to St. Paul Island. So I get to travel to a lot of regions and work those fisheries in those areas too. So every day looks different. Wow, that sounds really, really cool. Um, Michelle was wondering what happens to people who break the rules? Well, a big part for NOAA is compliance. And sometimes maybe they didn't know that rule even was there in the first place. So a lot of things we do is education before people even start fishing or before the start of a new season. Um, the fishermen that I come in contact with are the same fishermen that I'm going to see next week or next year. So we really try to work with the partners that we have to get them to understand what the rules are and how to follow them. You know, if they keep determining, trying to break them and they don't want to follow the rules, then they might get a fine. A lot of what we do is civil penalty, which means instead of going to jail or, you know, having something on their license we just say you know you took this fish you now owe us a hundred dollars or five hundred dollars and we take the fish from them that they're not supposed to have gotcha 
Um, we had a couple of questions about uh, rules. So um, Isabella was wondering what, what the catch limits are. And um, let's see, um, Marcus was wondering, are there only certain times in the day when fishing is allowed? And so are these, you know, the, the rules must be written down somewhere. Are, is there like a fishing book that people use or uh, a website that they refer to? Well, our rules and regulations that NOAA enforces can be found on our website in the Code of Federal Regulations. Um, and those are on, there's electronic copies of that as well. But um, we also enforce international, I have one right here, which is the IPHC Annual Management Measures. But this gets adopted into our Code of Federal Regulations. So all of that can be found on the NOAA website. Um, you just look for rules and regulations. It is very confusing to read through, especially if you don't understand the fishery at all. So we always tell people that they can call us or the scientists if they have any questions as well. Yeah, I would imagine with so many different fisheries, it might be it might get confusing as to which rules apply to which fisheries in which cases. Yeah. So yeah, and I, I can reference. answer a, a, another part of that question, and that is. Um, referring to uh, how much can be caught of a particular species. So uh, each individual federally managed species or fishery stock uh, has a separate um, analysis done by the scientists to determine the health of that particular population. So, so that data that are collected by the scientists uh, are then used to inform the management uh, and we discussed that briefly when we were talking about the three-legged stool. So the management will take the data uh, and determine how much of, let's say, a, a halibut population or how much of a black cod population can be harvested from one year, uh, and that quota may change the next year. So um, it's an adaptive process uh, and can be used to, to make sure that even though there are changes from year to year, uh, we can try to set the quotas in a way that is most sustainable over time. So excellent questions. Great. Well, um, I know that you have a lot more material to cover, so I, I think we'll hold on to the rest of our questions until the next question break, and uh, maybe we should go on to the next section. Great. Well, thank you very much for those questions. We look forward to answering more later. Uh, so, OLE's mission is protecting marine wildlife and habitat to conserve these resources for future generations. How do we do that? Well, we do that, as we've mentioned, by enforcing the United States laws uh, and international treaties. Uh, and those are some examples that Amy brought up in her last answer. So, there's a number of laws that, that Office of Law Enforcement primarily enforces in Alaska. Uh, one is called the Magnuson-Stevens Fisheries Conservation and Management Act, which is referred to as the MSA. Uh, another is the North Pacific Halibut Act. Uh, another one that's important to us is the Marine Mammal Protection Act. Uh, we also have the Endangered Species Act and the Lacey Act. Uh, and then we have over there a pie chart, which shows for the year 2020, uh, how many cases Office of Law Enforcement had for each one of those different laws. So I'm going to go briefly through this slide. Uh, these are the tools that are available to us with Office of Law Enforcement. Uh, so we have community engagement, uh, and we're going to get into these uh, more detailed in future slides. Uh, so that is education and outreach. Uh, we have patrols that we do, boardings of vessels, uh, and then we have vessel monitoring system. Uh, we also, if it's necessary, uh, when, we, when we get information about uh, people who have broken the rules, uh, we conduct investigations into those. Uh, and, and we'll talk about the partnerships that we have. Uh, we have partnerships that help us manage the fisheries, and partnerships that also help us enforce the fisheries. And those partnerships are include state partnerships 
tribal partnerships, uh, other federal agencies, and non-governmental organizations. Uh, and then we have the developing use of new technology. So we'll start out by, by going into more detail about community engagement, education and outreach. Uh, so as Amy mentioned, the laws are very complicated. Sometimes they're difficult to understand. So uh, a component to effective enforcement is educating the fishermen uh, and the public into what the regulations are uh, and how they can affect the harvest. So we will, uh, work with various different uh, sportsman shows. Uh, we'll use educational venues like this one where we're talking today. Uh, and then we'll do fishery related shows as well, such as Comfish and Kodiak, uh, which our Kodiak viewers are familiar with. As mentioned, we also make use of patrols, boardings and vessel monitoring systems. So uh, we have a, a set of boats and we go out to sea and we can board commercial and recreational fishing boats to ensure that everything is being done in compliance with the regulations. Uh, and we have a short video here to explain what the heck vessel monitoring systems are. All right, so I'll get that loaded up here and we'll get started in just a sec here. The Office of Law Enforcement also uses advanced technology, including a vessel monitoring system, or VMS. Alaska is one region where VMS is in place. Due to the volume of fish delivered in Alaska, the numerous vessels, the huge areas that we deal with, there's no possible way to actually have manned patrol vessels out there. VMS allows us to leverage technology to be aware of the fishing grounds, who's where, what they're harvesting. That's just one of the many tools we use for enforcement. All right, so we're back to you, Alex. Excellent, thank you. So I'm going to turn it over to Wynn, uh, and he's going to explain investigations to you, uh, in particular one investigation. How's it going? So uh, again, I'm Wynn, and I'm an investigator with the uh, Office of Law Enforcement. And uh, one of the things that we do is we investigate um, incidents or crimes whenever uh, something bad happens. And in this situation, it was uh, um, illegal take, illegal shooting of marine mammals. And these marine mammals were protected under the Marine Mammal Protection Act and the Endangered Species Act. So we would go into this like a, another law enforcement agency and a city or a state and investigate it um, as a crime, which it is a crime and it was a crime. In this situation, there were 15 dead stellar sea lions found on the beach near Cordova, Alaska. Um, through the investigation, we found there was a shotgun that shot the stellar sea lions. Um, we had rewards offered for people to give us information. Um, we, had, we used other investigative tools like subpoenas, and we had witnesses. We used search warrants and many other things. And what we found out that there were two main suspects that shot the 15 stellar sea lions because they were eating their fish, um, which is against the law. You can't do that in this situation. So we conducted an investigation, and from the investigation, um, we found out what happened. And then we took that to court, to the courts to make a decision of what happens with these people now that we catch them. Um, so through that, we found that there was a captain, and the captain, um, he, was, he wasn't that good of a captain. He received five years probation with shooting the sea lions, and he had to pay a $20,000 fine. And he had a lot of community service work to do, and he had to tell everybody of the wrongdoings he did. There was also a mate that assisted the captain in shooting these dead stellar, or these stellar sea lions. And that mate received five years probation and had a $5,000 fine. But these guys were lucky because they didn't have to go to jail. In some situations, in some of the investigations we have, some people have went to jail, and uh, these guys were lucky. 
So I didn't have to do that. Great, thank you very much for explaining that to us, Wynn. I'm sure there'll be some questions. Uh, before there are, we're going to continue on with this presentation. So set those questions in your minds and bring them up in a minute. Uh, so with respect to the partnerships and cooperative enforcement, uh, we work with, as mentioned, uh, Alaska Department of Fish and Game, Alaska Wildlife Troopers. Uh, this big boat that you see on the left of the screen is an Alaska Wildlife Trooper boat, and there are both state troopers and OLE officers on board that boat. Uh, they, we work with other federal agencies like the National Park Service, uh, United States Coast Guard, and many, many others that haven't been named in order to cooperatively manage our resources. Uh, over there on the right, you see the Alaska Eskimo Whaling Commission. Uh, we also work with them uh, just to work on uh, managing the health of the mammal populations. Uh, Wynn, can I ask you to explain to us the developing technologies? Yes, I will. Um, so we have a lot of developing technologies. Um, one of those is the underwater remotely operated vehicle, or ROV. And if you look on the screen, you can see there's some lobster gear um, and there's a right whale near the lobster gear. Well, what we're doing with the ROVs is we're going down under the water and some of these lobster, um, this lobster gear, and, the, and specifically this is in the Northeast part of the United States. So this isn't in Alaska right now. We're testing this in the Northeast part of the United States around Massachusetts, Maine, <clears throat> New England area, those areas. And we're making sure that the lobster gear is legal so that the endangered right whale won't get caught up in the lobster gear and potentially die. Um, earlier Guy spoke about in the video, he spoke about VMS advanced features. And then we have international cooperation on tracking tools. And this is really cool. One of the things we do is we have satellites that we're using to look to see if we can find illegal fishing. And some of those partners that we have um, are with Canada and we travel a lot, like Amy was saying before. So one of the places that, that I've traveled with some of my uh, um, work stuff is Canada, but also in the back, I got some other places that I've traveled to for work and that we discuss um, technologies to include um, the satellites who find these vessels out in the middle of the ocean in the middle of nowhere and we can kind of see what they're doing or at least try to find out what they're doing but oh, this is my lunch let me get out let me move this but right here this reminds me of when i went to peru and i worked with the peruvian government and the ecuadorians and um you know some other partners in there too and we help them to fight their illegal fishing coming into their ports. We've also been to Spain, or I've been to Spain, and I've been to Croatia to do the same thing. So the cool thing about my job is we get to travel around and go to different places if we get lucky enough and help fight illegal fishing all across the globe. Great. Well, maybe we should stop for some questions. Um, because I know that you guys have another video that you'd like to show and we've got about 12 minutes left. So we'll stop for a few more questions. And I think that some of your questions actually um, were answered when Wynn was talking about um, investigations because um, Davis was wondering whether you'd ever had to arrest somebody. And Michelle had also, oh, Michelle had wondered what happens to people who break the rules and we had talked about the fines and stuff. But, um, um, so um, do you actually arrest the people or do you, do you do the investigations and then turn that information over to other agencies? Well, it depends. Sometimes we do arrest the people and sometimes we do turn those um, cases over to other people um, or other uh, organizations. For example, we conduct the investigation and we see that there isn't necessarily a federal violation, but there is a state violation then we'll turn that over to one of our state partners, which I believe we have 26 state partners across the country um, that are you know, partners with, the, um, with NOAA. In Alaska, that's the Alaska Wildlife Troopers. Um, in Georgia, that's the Georgia Department of Natural Resources. So it just depends on the case. 
and speaking of partners, um, Jasper was wondering um, whether you collaborate with the Coast Guard. Yes, we do. We collaborate with the Coast Guard all the time. Um, they have the big boats that take that can get out in the middle of nowhere into the ocean hundreds of miles offshore. So a lot of times we go out there with them. Sometimes before they go on their patrols, we'll work with them and we'll say, hey, this is what our priorities are. This is what we're looking for. And this is what we'd like you to look for. And uh, which they appreciate a lot. So then they'll go out there and uh, enforce those. And then a lot of people that work with us used to be in the Coast Guard, like Amy and uh, many other people that work with us. Great. Um, Adam from Amy's class was wondering how many people on average do you ticket or arrest each year? That's a good question. And uh, that's a that's a question that I can't answer right now because I don't know. Um, but as far as the rest, <clears throat> we don't arrest a lot of people for fisheries violations. Um, we, we, we give a lot of compliance and education. Um, we give written warnings. We give uh, verbal compliance. We give summary settlements. And uh, then sometimes our cases go to our, our attorneys at general counsel enforcement section or to U.S. attorney's office. Very rarely do we arrest people, um, but sometimes we have to. And Mia was wondering, um, you know, you had mentioned that those two people that you were talking about in the Stellar Sea Line case got probation, so they didn't actually have to go to jail. But do people go to jail for um, sentences after they've killed marine mammals? Uh, sometimes people have. A lot of that depends on the area you're, you're located in the country. It depends on the judge. Um, it depends on possibly the jury as well, if that goes to a criminal trial. So uh, sometimes people have gone to jail uh, for killing illegal marine mammals or um, sea turtles as well. For example, this is a case right here that we investigated. And I don't know the outcome of the case because this is a, a stellar sea lion skull and it was here before I got here. But if you can see, there's a hole in the skull. So what we would do is try to figure out why is there a hole in the skull? Why, what happened to this, you know, if we found this out in the middle of nowhere on the beach or something, that would be part of the investigation. Um, was it taken by an Alaska native or was it taken by somebody who just didn't like stellar sea lions and wanted to kill them? Um, you know, so those are the types of things we look for in our investigations. They should make a, a television series about sort of like CSI, Office of Law Enforcement or something like that. Yeah. Um, and actually, that's a good um, segue into our last section, because I know you guys were going to talk about marine mammals. So I was wondering if you wanted to say a few words before we started the, the marine mammal video. Uh, I think we can move into the next section. So, um, <clears throat> so we figured that you guys would be more excited to see live marine mammals. So Wynn and I got to go and visit the Alaska Zoo. So we wanted to show you what we did at the Alaska Zoo. Um, we worked with harbor seals. Uh, and I should mention that this is the time of year that harbor seals are pupping. Uh, and it is common practice for the mothers to go and harvest and leave the pups on the beach. So if you guys are near beaches and you happen to see seal pups, uh, please make sure that you follow the rules. Uh, and those rules are that you leave those pups alone on the beach. Don't worry, mama's coming back. So uh, I should also say that uh, don't try this at home. Uh, we are working with uh, marine mammals, harbor seals that have been in captivity for a long time. But we thought it would be very cool if you guys could see some of the marine mammals that we work with on a regular basis and us interacting with those marine mammals. So Lisa, can you please kick it off? Sure, and actually as I'm loading this up, um, I wanted to also mention that you guys also um, help help um, with stranded marine mammals and uh, taking them to the zoo and this, the Alaska Sea Life Center, I think. Is that right, Alex? That is an excellent point. And in fact, uh, one of the seals that you will see, his name is Onyx, uh, was brought to us from the Sea Life Center. Uh, and so we are partners in the Alaska Marine Mammal Stranding Network. Uh, as you mentioned, thank you, Lisa. Uh, so we will have officers and agents in ports that maybe other NOAA um, people are not. So in case anybody in the audience 
sees a stranded marine mammal, or in case anybody in some of these more remote ports where we might have an office uh, runs across a stranded marine mammal and reports it, uh, our officers and agents may respond to those calls and go help rescue those marine mammals. Uh, so the Sea Life Center gave Onyx to the zoo. So let's meet Onyx. Okay, here we go. So uh, here we are at the Alaska Zoo, and we are headed in the back entrance to go see some harbor seals. So what are you feeding? So they will be eating Pacific herring. This is local caught fish that is actually caught for the zoo. We tell them how many pounds that we need that we use about a year, and then they go out and catch it and bring it here to us. Um, and it's frozen, and then we defrost it under a cold water defrost, um, which is what I did this morning, and then this is what the seals will get to eat. Right now they're eating five pounds a day each, and that can fluctuate depending on the time of year, anywhere from just a couple pounds all the way up to maybe 10 or 12 pounds if you have a pregnancy. Oh, wow. okay. We're also going to add to that some vitamins. The gloves are not bite protection. Um, they are mostly just to keep our hands from smelling like fish all the time. Have you ever been bitten by one of the seals? Yes. How did it hurt? It did hurt. And I guess the risk in the wild, um, with the wild seals, is that there's a, a thing called seal finger. And it's an infection that you, you can get, and it actually comes from the food that they eat, which would be like the herring or squid or other types. And those eat off the bottom of the ocean, and then they pick up this bacteria, and then the seals eat it. And then when the seal bites a human or something, it can transfer into your system. Here we are at the zoo. Uh, we're with animal caretaker uh, Beth Fogelson. Uh, and we are checking out the harbor seals that they have. They have two harbor seals here. Thank you very much for having us, Beth. No, thank you for coming. And thank you for uh, coming and visiting Onyx and his girlfriend, Chloe, over here. We're really glad to have you. And glad to know that there are folks out there interested um, in what you guys do to protect these uh, amazing critters and stay out there and keep them safe. So I've been here at the Alaska Zoo. I'm on my 21st year. I started in October of 2000. Responsibilities here are our Pacific Carter Seals, our river otters, our polar bears, um, and then in there to keep it up a little bit exciting is our coyotes. Oh, well, okay. our coyote. <laughs> so. Do you get into the, into the uh, environment with the polar bears the same way you do with the seals? So no. This, the way that we work with these seals is called free contact. That means that we can freely work with them, we can touch them, um, we can be in the same physical space with them without any type of barrier. Uh, with like our large carnivores, like the polar bears, uh, we call that protective contact because we always have a physical barrier between us and that animal. Whether it's um, a fence, a wall, um, a moat, something like that to protect you from actually being in the same place. Obviously those animals are dangerous and can potentially be dangerous. But they usually have their pups around uh, June, July. So we'll just monitor her and see if she looks like she's getting any heavier. Take daily weights and things like that as the time gets closer and see. So I was I was reading about harbor seals, uh, and what I read is that they normally live about 25 or 30 years. Uh, so it sounds like Chloe is is getting up there in age. But uh, Shannon mentioned that there have been uh, harbor seals that bred all the way in the 40s. In the 40s, old. that's correct. Wow. Yep, and as we're seeing now, uh, the life expectancy of these guys is getting upwards to 40 years. Wow. Um, improvements, obviously, in uh, diet management, veterinary management, health management overall has improved enough that um, we can give them more longevity in life. OK, well, thanks for sharing that with us, Alex. That, that was a pretty cool. Um, video of you guys at the zoo and a good a good window into what the harbor seals are like that that you're helping to protect. Yeah, uh, it was a great time. Um, we hope you enjoyed it. So uh, that 
is the end of our presentation. So uh, if the other presenters can come back on screen, if we have time, uh, Lisa, let us know if we do. We would love to answer any further questions that you guys have. Well, we are just about at the end of our time, but um, we have a couple minutes left and I just had wanted to ask all three of you, um, what is the favorite part of your job? And I was wondering whether Amy could go first. Uh, the favorite part of my job is the travel and the new places and people that I get to meet. I have met some wonderful, friendly people all over the state, all over the country, and like winds all over the world when I've got to travel. Great. Thank you so much, Amy. Alex, what about you? What's the favorite part of your job? That is a great question. Uh, so I really enjoy working with the, the industry members. Uh, I love the aspect that I get to uh, help educate the public and uh, work with the public to ensure that they have an understanding of uh, not only what the rules and regulations are, but also how to follow them. So I really like interacting with people uh, and working to ensure that everybody can comply with some complicated regulations. Great. And when? what's your favorite part of your job? <clears throat> I like working with my coworkers. Um, we have a great group of people that we work with, and everybody comes from different backgrounds, um, you know, different origins, and um, everybody has something different to add. So I like working with different people, like Alex, Amy, and you. And in addition to that, I like getting outside and being on the docks, smelling the fresh air, smelling the salt water. Sometimes when you get near a stinky seal or a stinky sea lion, it kind of smells a little bit. But other than that, it's really fun. That sounds really great. Well, thank you to all three of you for coming on and sharing all this information about your jobs with us. And um, we've gotten a lot of really interested people on the line. And um, I'm hoping that maybe you guys have inspired them to maybe check out the Office of Law Enforcement when they get to that point. And um, thanks very much for sharing your jobs with us. Well, thanks for letting us present and show you all the different ways uh, various different ways that you can get involved with Office of Law Enforcement. So uh, thank you to the audience for joining. Great. Thank you all in our audience for joining us, and we'll see you again next week. Um, tomorrow, there's a, a, a NOAA Live webinar on the Navajo Nation on weather forecasting, and so please join us there. And then next week, we're going to be looking at sharks, so it'll be pretty interesting. Thanks again, and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.